So yeah, hope everyone had a good week. Um, welcome to the second class of, uh, of CS472. We'll have uh, Professor Eleni Lenos. So she's a professor of dermatology um, and health policy at Stanford. She's been doing a lot of really interesting work on the impact of COVID-19, especially on community health and well-being. So happy to hear about her uh, research projects. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And again, just want to double check. You can see my slides. Um, yes. Can yes. everyone see them now? Uh, perfect. So today, um, hmm, and I can't seem to advance them now. Oh, here we go. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about this Stanford coronavirus survey that we launched in early March. And um, I, uh, I want to uh, start by saying this really was a team effort. And that's why I had the pictures of the team uh, members who participated right at the beginning. It was a collaboration between the Department of Epidemiology, um, the Department of Communication, population health sciences. I'm also in the Department of Dermatology. And really it was one, wonderful to see everyone come together to try and understand uh, the impact of this crisis on people's lives. So specifically what we wanted to do was to assess concerns about uh, COVID-19, both physical symptoms, individual reactions, and actions in response to the pandemic. So we created this um, IRB approved survey that was disseminated on social media starting March 14th. Um, again, th these are all the team members who, who participated in designing and disseminating uh, the survey. Um, and to give you an example, you know, this is one of the tweets that was shared broadly um, and we disseminated the survey on Nextdoor uh, Facebook and Twitter, with Twitter having the most um, uh, the most responses. In this slide, I show you the map of the United States where the study sample came from in the first 48 hours. And we were very fortunate that we were able to do this before shelter-in-place um, decisions and orders were announced. And so the data we collected includes data before shelter in place and after. Um, and also the timing here was very important because we were able to collect data when there was a very high interest in COVID, but before, um, you know, before policies were enacted. And so we had a high response rate. I think the first 48 hours, we had about 10,000 responses. Um, and this is how they're, they're distributed. Looking at the demographic characteristics of our respondents, um, the first row here shows timing of survey response. So we dichotomized our data uh, before and after March 16th. Now March 16th, for those of you in the Bay Area may remember was when uh, the first announcement came for shelter in place in six counties in the Bay Area. And that was the first time that announcement hit the news. And so we, um, are assuming that that announcement may have influenced people even outside those specific communities that the order applied to. And so in order to really compare data before and after the announcements to assess the impact of policies, we picked this time point of midnight on March 16th to try and define the most specific pre-exposure group. So we're assuming that Saturday and Sunday, the day before these announcements were made, um, are definitely clean groups of, of pre-exposure, pre-announcement. Um, as you can see, um, a significant proportion of our respondents came from California compared to other states. And um, in the columns here, you'll see California had about 6,000 respondents. Other states had uh, about 11,000. This, this data comes from the first uh, approximately 10 days of data and excludes the uh, participants who did not complete the survey or had uh, more than 80% or less than 80% of the data complete. So overall, we had about 25,000 responses and 17,500 of those are, uh, are near complete data points. Uh, our sample was predominantly female. So, so overall, about 70% of our respondents were women. Um, as you can see, 
it skews to the younger age spectrum with uh, only 11% over 65 years of age. And it's predominantly white, which is a significant disadvantage, especially as racial disparities become more pronounced and more important during this crisis. Our first study was published last week um, in, in JAMA Internal Medicine, and it relates to public concerns about the COVID pandemic. Um, so some of the questions we asked related to quantitative um, uh, exposures and some were qualitative open-ended text questions. And here I'll show you some of our preliminary results. Um, we assessed public concerns and asked people how concerned they were about COVID-19 and analyzed this by generation. And what you can see here is that younger participants uh, those in Gen Z aged 18 to 24, the, the bottom um, row in this graph, uh, in general, um, were more likely to be a little concerned or moderately concerned and less likely to be very or extremely concerned compared to say 40 to 54 year olds or 25 to 39 year olds. So there seems to be a pattern uh, of level of concern by age. Now again, this data was analyzed from the first 48 hours. So this was the early uh, uh, sentiment um, in the United States. And obviously that may vary over time. And because we have data from this survey longitudinally over time, um, we're able to, uh, to look at those changes as well. Um, this other data point shows uh, some of the biggest lifestyle changes in response to COVID-19. So we asked pay, uh, participants what changes they had made. Uh, again, early on, this is March 14th and 15th data. And the most common change was really hand washing. Avoiding social gatherings was also common. Stocking up on food and supplies, avoiding or canceling travel, and working from home. Now, another really interesting set of data that we collected in addition to the quantitative uh, 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 data we collected from the survey were free text responses. And the two questions we, uh, we were particularly interested in analyzing, the first is tell us how the coronavirus crisis is impacting your life. And participants were able to um, you know, type in free text uh, to respond to that. And the second question, among participants who said they weren't self-isolating, we asked them why. So we asked them, what are the reasons you are not self-isolating more? Um, and this data was uh, analyzed uh, by Ryan Moore, who I'm hoping has joined us as well to talk a I'm little here. bit about <laughs> his, hey, Ryan, um, hey. how should I do this? Do you want to talk and I show this or do you want to show, show your screen? You. Um, if you, as long as you have the figure and table in your slides, we'll just go with your slides. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So do you want to um, explain what you did for this analysis, Ryan? And maybe introduce sure. your <laughs> Okay, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ryan. Um, I'm a PhD student in the Department of Communication, um, working in the social media lab. Um, and as Eleni mentioned, um, we also, in addition to analyzing those sort of uh, close-ended survey questions analyzed free text to the response to these two questions. And they kind of mirror the questions that um, Eleni just presented, the close-ended questions. The one is about like, what is the impact? And the second one is like, so what actions are you taking? Or what are the reasons you're not taking those actions? And so if you want to go on to the, the figure, Eleni? Yep. Okay, so this is the first question, uh, which is uh, tell us how the coronavirus uh, is impacting your life. And so I'll walk through like what all of this is. And so basically um, individuals typed um, free text in response to this question. Um, on average, people typed about 70 words to explain um, the impact of COVID on their lives. Um, and I used, uh, we, we analyzed that data in this case computationally using a tool called LUC, L-I-W-C. Um, and Luke is really nice. Um, basically, you can feed in text. Um, so, you know, it could be a book, it could be a tweet, it could be a survey response. And what Luke will do is it contains a bunch of different dictionaries um, for things like emotional terms, for topical terms, for 
different grammatical things like pronouns um, and conjunctions. And it will um, tell you the, the percentage of whatever those different linguistic categories are in a given amount of text. Um, and so what we did was we fed, um, uh, I think it was about 7,000 free text responses ranging from March 2014th before shelter in place all the way to March 22nd, a bit after shelter in place in the Bay Area um, to see um, like what kind of linguistic features were in those responses and specifically how they varied um, by age group. So um, these different on the X axis and all of these are age groups that correspond to the amount of risk that individuals face. Um, the, the tool is L-I-W-C. Uh, just give that a Google. They have a really nice website. Super easy to use. If you're interested in getting into NLP, um, and you, it has like a GUI. It's very easy to use. Um, but anyway, uh, no problem. So uh, the x-axis are different age groups that face different levels of risk that we're all familiar with. Um, and so I'm just going to talk about a couple of the different dictionaries that we focused on and found differences. So if you look in the leftmost column, we see sentiment. Uh, specifically, we looked at positive emotion terms and anxiety related terms. And what you can see is that, interestingly, younger um, individuals were the least positive um, in their language and uh, displayed the greatest levels of anxiety, um, which I'll talk about in a second. In the middle column, we see this thing we call self other focus. So this is the extent to which in your language you talk about yourself versus you talk about other people. We looked at that using um, people's use of first sing person singular pronoun words like I and me, um, and also uh, people's use of plural pronoun words like we and us. And you can see again that, that younger folks, uh, 18 to 31, were significantly higher in their sort of self-focus than other age groups, and that they were at, uh, sort of uh, relatedly lower in their sort of group focus compared to other age groups. Um, and so there's some interesting things um, sort of going on here. Um, you know, one interpretation could be that, oh, wow, you know, younger individuals seem to be very um, self-focused and less focused on the needs or the impacts onto others. But another thing that I think is interesting, and we can't tell which of these is the case, but I think another explanation is that uh, younger folks tend to maybe live less grounded lives. Like they might not have, um, especially at this time when the policy response to the crisis was developing, they maybe didn't know where they were going to be geographically, how they were going to respond to changes to schooling and things like that. And so uh, this, these sort of higher rates of talking about yourself and less about others could have been a function of simply the amount of change that younger people may have experienced compared to older people who have a stable place to live who are sort of more grounded. So I think it's interesting to think about those possibilities. Um, and then the final thing that we did here is that on this uh, far right column, we uh, just looked at some topics that we thought might differ um, between age groups. And we found that uh, middle-aged folks tend to talk a lot more about, fa significantly more about family um, than did the other age groups, which makes sense. And finally, um, older folks were the most likely to use biological terms um, like cough, sick, condition, things like that, um, which kind of went in line with what we would have expected based upon their um, increased uh, level of risk to the virus. Um, great, uh, so that's these data. Um, I see some stuff coming in. Um, should I answer this now or do it at the end or? Yeah, maybe we can do a couple questions now. So there's that's Alex. Okay. Do you want to do you want to ask? So I think we've got Alexander and Claire. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was just saying, yeah, that the difference could be since younger people maybe live themselves like in, in one household and that's why they just refer to themselves as I or me, whereas older people kind of uh, already have a family. So they talk uh, about all the family members together and that that's a concern, you know, but I guess you could check it, right? Because you have variables on household type, I guess, and whether you live with yeah. other people or not. So sort of to rule out this kind of, you know, trivial concern. So you, you could yeah. rule it out. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. I think that's a, a really good thought. And um, it could be something we could look at yeah. as it relates to, because we know who people cohabitate with based upon the survey. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense how that would show up in language. Great. Claire? Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I guess it's kind of a question of similar vein, but 
I know that in general, we find that like pronoun use varies quite a bit based on demographic factors such as gender um, or age range. And I'm just wondering um, how this compares to difference in language use just more generally and more broadly and um, not necessarily an answer to this question, but if you were to analyze, for example, um, the language use of younger adults versus older adults, do we see this more broadly as well or is this specific to this question? Yeah, so uh, there's a bit of, so uh, there's some work on, on exactly what you're talking about. There definitely is. There's also some specifically that I'm more familiar with using Luke, um, which is the same tool I used here. And they do tend to find that people speak more positively in general as they age. Um, um, so that's something that we're also seeing here. So I think it's a, it's an, it, this may very well be in line with what we might see generally in language. Um, I haven't necessarily looked at each of the sort of variables here. Um, but I know that in the case of um, the positivity and also um, we tend to see less self-focus um, in older age as well. So yeah, these could be general trends that are manifesting in response to this particular question. Um, um, but there were some, um, yeah, that's all I'll say for that. But I think it's a good thought. Maybe just in the interest of time, we can have our Eleni and Ryan go a little bit more and then have questions at the end. Sure. Um, Ryan, I didn't pull up the table, but did you want to just yeah. briefly say what you what you found when you analyzed the question, the second question? And this was in right. response to the reasons for not self isolating. Sure. So, um, so no problem. Um, the uh, so there was this question, why are you not self isolating more? Um, just as a before I talk about those reasons. Uh, younger people we found were significantly le more likely um, to say that they weren't self-isolating um, than all of the other age groups. Um, so that's just something kind of to go in line with what I just showed. Um, specifically in these reasons, so the way that we did this was not computational. It was um, more of like a content analytic. So um, we looked over all the responses and we came up with um, seven different categories. Um, and then we had several people code um, into those categories. So I'll just briefly talk about the most prominent ones. The most common um, reason people gave for not um, self-isolating more was um, related to work. Uh, maybe unsurprisingly, um, people were saying that uh, an example is, you know, my work isn't canceled. If I don't go, I will lose my job. Um, and perhaps if we did this now, that maybe there's been uh, a change in the policies that employers um, have. Uh, maybe this would be different, but at this time, work was the number one reason. Uh, a, a close second was mental, uh, mental um, and physical health. People talked about concerns around things like cabin fever. Um, people said that self-isolation um, would drive them um, to poor states of mental health. Um, that's something that was, was really prominent. About a fifth of the participants um, said that. Um, and then um, the, uh, what we could do, was, Ryan, is share, we could share your paper that's actually posted on uh, MedArchives uh, on the chat so people can oh, review sure. those, those themes. I think that, that might be helpful if people are interested. Interestingly, yeah. I found it very reassuring that after your paper was, uh, was published online, identifying non-essential work as one of the key reasons or, uh, that came up. John Oliver did a segment on Sunday <laughs> on non-essential work. So that's worth watching as well. And it's much more entertaining than our, our, our science. So, so check that out too. Um, yeah, so okay. I just posted the link to the paper and, uh, but, and so you can take a look if you, if you like uh, further, but thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that, uh, Ryan. So briefly, I I just want to mention that this data has been incredibly interesting and uh, rewarding to, to look at and analyze. Um, we have the second wave of the study ongoing and live right now where we added questions both about trust in government, trust in uh, public institutions. We added questions about experiences of discrimination uh, due to race or ethnicity. And we added um, additional questions on mental health and anxiety. That data is coming in now. Uh, so far, we have about 3,600 responses. We really need to disseminate it further. So if anyone can help post the survey on social media, the, the particular group that we realize is um, greatly underrepresented is the African-American community. And as news reports emerge of health disparities by race and ethnicity of this crisis, it's even more 
crucial to collect data and make sure everyone's voice is heard. Um, so we'd love your help with that. Um, and then I wanted to just highlight a few limitations. The, the main limitation here is sampling methodology. So this is not a nationally representative sample. So our inferences can't necessarily um, be uh, interpreted as nationally representative. That said, with 25,000 responses, um, we're, we're pretty sure we are capturing you know, uh, tr true, true feelings from the population sampled. And so it's useful to have the demographics to be able to stratify um, and at least know within the, the populations who did take the survey how, how people are, are feeling. And one thing to note is we, we noticed very high levels of concern. So 95% of people were, were concerned about this. And if our sample, we say it's skewed towards being very highly educated, uh, more white, this, this is a population that has, uh, has, has means and yet is experiencing tremendous difficulties. What does that mean for populations that are more vulnerable, that have fewer means? So if anything, you know, this data should be taken in the context of, well, you know, if, if, if this particular population is experiencing such tremendous impact and difficulty, what does that mean for those less fortunate? And so we're trying to expand our survey um, and we're also collecting additional information on income, geography, and education to try and get a more representative sample. Um, so that's what I wanted to mention on limitations. And then just to leave you on a positive note, we did add this question. Although this is a challenging time, can you tell us about any positive effects or silver linings that you have experienced during this time? And this is just a, a you know, simple word cloud of the first thousand responses. Most of these are really heartwarming and they talk about time with family, slowing down, uh, time sp spent with, with children, quality time, being connecting with people they love. And so, you know, I think even though this is a really challenging time, some silver linings will come from this and identifying those is also important. Um, so with that, again, I'm going back to the team that has helped this ha happen so far. Uh, we'd love your, your help and support disseminating it. I know some of you are gonna help with the data analysis too. Um, so thank you so much for, for having us and thank you, Brian, as well for joining. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you, much. Thank you very much, Lenny and Ryan, for this uh, very nice presentation. And Lenny is also a mentor for the for course project, so sh so if you have more questions, you can follow up with her. Um, maybe we can do a few more questions if you have time. I have one question, just just to um. So, have you seen any interesting temporal changes? I mean, you have some data from pre prior to March 16th, not from March 16th. Have you seen interesting changes in the sentiment and the concerns? Yeah, we have actually. That's not published yet, but we're analyzing it now. So initially we were really surprised by this because what we saw was comparing pre to post, um, we saw anxiety go down. And so initially, you know, I was like, oh, is there something wrong with our coding? Um, that seems to be consistent in Ryan's um, NLP analysis too, though. And so the more we thought about it, the more we realized that perhaps what was happening is before any shelter in place announcements were made, people were very anxious because they didn't know what was going to happen next. And then after those announcements were made, perhaps people had a sense that the government was doing something, that policies were enacted. Um, we're actively looking at that data now, so it's not final, but that's one clear um, a trend we noticed that was surprising. The other temporal tra trend that was not surprising was that, you know, people did increase self-isolation practices. So we asked about self-isolation before and after, and there's a clear increase. So uh, both in California and across the United States, um, uh, more people are self-isolating. Um, and, and so those are the ones we've looked at so far. Uh, the third one to mention in terms of difficulties faced, there was a sharp increase in difficulty obtaining food, which many of us may have experienced too, um, uh, you know, here in California. So that was one where it's much more pronounced within California than other states when comparing pre and post uh, shelter in place announcement. Um, but more to come, we're looking at that data in detail now. 
Thanks, Lena. And we also have one more question from Matthias. Do we have time for that? Yeah. Yeah. We have as much time as my kids will allow. <laughs> so if anyone runs in, I apologize. Matthias. Ask that given given the means that uh, you're using to distribute the survey, uh, it feels like I don't know, people that are more concerned about this whole thing, this whole pandemic, are the ones that are more likely to, I don't know, search uh, in the internet things about the COVID and then come across with the survey and then you would have like a selection problem in that, in that case. And my, my follow-up question would be that people uh, who are less likely to being able to stop working or, or I don't know, to, to not being able to do their work at home are another and, and cannot comply with the shelter in place for, for I don't know, uh, economic reasons are another potential group of interest to analyze. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And it, it goes back to the limitations of this methodology. You know, we wanted to rapidly assess public sentiment. And so we used social media to disseminate a survey rapidly to a large number of people. But you're right, people who complete surveys are different from people who do not. What we tried to do was to look at demographic characteristics for those who completed it early versus late, assuming that those who took the survey early may be the ones that, you know, somehow were different demographically because they were online sooner um, or searching earlier. Um, so we're looking at those differences, but but you're right that that's a that's a major limitation of of this methodology. Great, thank you. Great. Other questions? I have one more. So you mentioned this related to the previous one that you like to reach out to more diverse populations, more diverse social economic groups. Um, yes, what are the, maybe you can give, say a little bit about what are the best approaches for doing that from a methodology perspective? Sure. Um, so there's this, there's this balance between what is the optimal methodologic approach and what is feasible given the urgency of this time frame. So the approach we are, you know, I'm an epidemiologist as well, so I'm very aware that the approach we are using has several major limitations. Um, and, you know, optimally what you would want to do is get a geographically representative sample by address. You'd want to make sure it's representative of the county or state uh, that you are studying, uh, both in terms of geography, socioeconomic factors, um, income, education, age, um, and sample people, you know, maybe based on their addresses. Uh, to, to be representative and a truly random sample of, of a neighborhood or a community. Um, that's very difficult to do uh, rapidly. However, the Department of Epidemiology is setting up uh, um, such a study and Lisa Goldman Rosas, as well as Lorraine Nelson are leading this specifically for the Bay Area. Um, I think in our case, what you know what we're trying to do is collect rapid data because this changes day by day uh, by disseminating it through community leaders through word of mouth we're considering reaching out through faith leaders because certain communities that's that's what a powerful way to reach uh, reach certain communities um, so we're using alternative approaches always recognizing the limitations of of this methodology now one interesting uh, way you can resolve that methodologically is if you wanted to somehow randomize your population and do an intervention. So if you had a sample of people and half received one survey that say had an intervention or a public health message and the other half had a different control group or intervention, in that case you eliminate uh, some of these biases when comparing between an intervention and control group, and then you can assess the impact of a certain uh, message itself um, by randomizing who receives the survey. So that's another approach we're considering uh, as a next step. Um, but again, tr trying to balance 
scientific rigor with speed, given time is of the essence to collect this data and disseminate it to policymakers, um, uh, is, is, it, is a challenge. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us and for sharing your very interesting projects. Of course. Thank you, Brian, thank well. you for having me. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay. So, what I want to do um, is to, for both for this class and then partly for the next class as well, to give people uh, a tutorial about what are some of the key mathematical models that are being used for this epidemiological modeling. Right. Um, and I think that's actually quite important to understand because these are really driving many of the important decisions that policymakers and governments are making, right? Decisions all the way from when do we start shelter in place to when do we sort of end shelter in place. Um, and I think, as we'll see, there's some, uh, these models are all relatively simplified models, right? So the key, I think, in looking at these models is to really understand what are the assumptions and limitations behind each of these models, right? To make that as clear and as transparent as possible. So we start with a sort of a very core model that I think that's the underlying foundation for many of these different applications, which is the SIR model, which I'll introduce. Right, I'll do that today, and then for next Friday, we'll take about half an hour to discuss actually the more um, the like the current models that people are using for the policy decisions. So I'm going to try to write on this my uh, whiteboard here, um, and also feel free to ask questions. Right, so the SIR model. Okay, I hope you can see that, All right? So it's basically, it's a kind of a, people call that the compartmental model, All right? So what that means is that there are basically three types of populations, right? So the S, which are the, so S corresponds to the susceptible, I is the infected, and then R is the recovered. All right, so you view that your entire population consists of these three different groups, right? And the model is basically going to be a way to see how do individuals go from each of these three compartments. So if you've seen these kind of uh, Markov chains before, right? So this is very similar to that, uh, where we have, we have these three states. So the susceptible, so think of that as being like the entire, initially the entire set of population, right? If I had all of the California or all of the US, right? So that's everybody could be susceptible. So that's your initial population, right? The infected are the people who, are the subset of susceptible people who have actually due to exposure is being infected with the virus. And the recovered ones are the, are the subset of the infected individuals who have uh, recovered from the virus, right? Who are no longer susceptible. Okay. So the, the key idea is to write down a set of, uh, behind these models is to pick, write down a set of equations that governs how are these three populations, the size of these three populations evolving over time. Okay. So let's just try to write down these equations together, right? Just to make sure, uh, and hopefully that will illustrate and make it clear that they're actually fairly intuitive equations. Okay, so, and, and for now, let's just think of this as being, uh, you know, again, SIR basically being the proportion of the population that are in each of these three compartments, right? So when we think about how does the S population change over time, right? So you start off with basically everybody in this S group, right? Um, so, so how should we try to model this, right? So it's probably reasonable to think that it's actually decreasing over time, right? Because you start off with everybody being susceptible, but as more and more people get infected, so it's likely to be actually, you know, the susceptible population cannot actually increase, right? It's only going to decrease over time. Right? So that's why there's usually a, a negative sign here. Um, so what should this depend on, right? So it should depend on the size of the S population, right? And it also should depend on how often this uh, susceptible population interacts or come to contact with the infected population. 
right? So that's how people try to model this, just by taking these products as being like the model for interactions. And the particular constant here, beta, which corresponds to, uh, so beta is the interacting contact rate. So how often would someone come into contact with uh, someone who's been infected? Okay. So the similarly for the infected population, right? So there's also, right? So everybody who gets, you know, who's affected here, right? Uh, from S, then they move into, they become infected, right? And then there's also some proportion of infected people that's actually recovered, right? So this new is basically the recovery rate. Okay, and then similarly, uh, people who recover, um, so that's how the number of recovered people increases, right? So this is actually basically the core, three core components of this model. So it's a set of differential equations that tells you how does the population size of each of these three compartments, three groups, increase over time. Now, does the model make sense to people? So right, far, so yeah. Go ahead. Can we clarify again what SI means? Yeah, so SI here just means it's just basically the product of S times I. James, we've also got a question um, from Taita. Yes, please ask. Ah, so how do we count, take on account people who die? Right, so in this model, um, the fatality is basically grouped together with the recovery. Right, so you can view the recovery, or in some other words, as everybody who's basically removed from the population who's no longer susceptible. Right, so this could be people who, because who have a developed immunity, or people who have passed away. Okay, so what what do people? So so this is actually a very commonly used model, right? And this is as we'll see, this is actually the model that's behind the. Um, the many of the decision-making process, right? So what do people think are some of the key assumptions behind this model, right? I mean, we have already actually derived the full model uh, in, you know, in the last few minutes. So this, this is the model, right? So what do you think are the key assumptions behind this model? Okay. Yeah. So Jean says there's constant rates, right? So that's a good question. That's a good point, right? So this, Rates of contact, so beta and nu, right? The rates of contact and recovery here, they're all constants in this model, right? So in reality, the contact rate could actually change because of government policies, right? So for example, when you have a uh, shelter in place, the contact rate actually decreases, right? So it really should be a time varying, um, time varying uh, parameter. Another question is like, all the people have the same contact rate, right? So Adi said that. Uh, and that's also a key assumption behind this model, right? So more generally, the model assumes that it's basically a, a uniform population, right? So basically everybody is basically interacting with everybody else. There's no heterogeneity in this model. Uh, we'll see some extensions of this that allows for, like next week, that allows for different cities and some sort of heterogeneity across different cities and migrations across different cities. But the core model itself is really homogeneous. So another key assumption that people mentioned here is that, yes, once people recover, they become immune, right? So that's also you know, a key assumption because there could actually be some reinfection rates, right, uh, which is not captured in this model. Okay, so I think, I think these are very good comments and they, uh, they, they actually really capture some of the key limitations and assumptions behind these kind of models. So if you haven't seen have or haven't had too much experience with these kind of models, I think it's actually useful to think about how do you, how does one try to get some intuitions from this kind of equations, right? Because you know, people can write down differential equations, but they're somehow only as useful as the insights that we can learn from these equations. So what are the insights? So the first insight is, okay, or maybe it's more of a, a, sort of a sanity check, right? So let's look at your mark. Right, okay, so initially, right, so to run these models, you have to give some initial conditions. Right, so the initial condition here is that we have to tell it what is S, I, and R at time equal to zero, 
right? You put, you put that those values in, and then you can numerically simulate these differential equations across time. Um, so initially, right, so S0 plus I0 plus R0 equals to one, right? Because there are proportions, and in the beginning, they make up the entire population. That's why they have to sum up to one. And one thing you know from these models is that um, you can actually check this, right? So ds plus dt is actually zero, right? If you add up these three terms, it's actually zero. So this actually means that um, that the across all the time, for all time, right? Okay, so so that's the useful property of the model, right? So across any time. Right, even without having to solve the model, solve the equations explicitly, we know that all of the three compartments still have to sum up to 100%. Right? So maybe that's a, a useful property. Right, so the other thing that's maybe useful to look at, right, too, is oftentimes it's useful to look at some of the extreme cases of these kinds of models. Right? So one extreme case is when nobody, let's say, uh, recovers. Right, so it's not realistic, but it's actually instructive to see what happens when nobody recovers. All right, so when new equal to zero, when the recovery rate is zero, the model actually simplifies quite a bit. Right, so that means that uh, uh, then we just have ds dt equals to i di Okay, so because the recovery population is always zero. And this is actually something that we can um, make sense of, I think, pretty intuitively, right? Uh, and it's also, you can also double check as a sanity check that's here, S plus I is always one, right? So we can actually plot out, um, then without having to solve these equations, we can actually plot out what this looks like. So this time, um, okay, so if we look at what this S population look like, right, just by solving this, you know, in this extreme case, right, so the S population will start off basically at close to one, right, as time goes on, right, because of this negative sign here, that just means that the population of S is always decreasing, right, certainly you cannot increase, and it's going to keep on decreasing until it gets to near zero, some other point. Right, so the curve is basically going to look something like this. Right. Um, actually, this is S. And the number of infected people are going to have the opposite pattern, right, because they have to sum up to one. So it has to basically just look at, they have to look like, look at the, the they have to be like flips of each other. So you can already tell that, I mean, that this also makes sense, right? So basically if nobody recovers, what the model would say is that after some time, the number of infected people would basically cover the entire population. Okay. And then, oops. So the third point, to, to look at, uh, which is also, I think, maybe the most interesting one is that, so in general, we're interested in the question of when is the infection rate actually increasing? Right? So that corresponds to when is the DIDT is actually larger than zero, right? So if DIDT is larger than zero, that means that the number of infected people is actually growing over time. Okay, so when does that happen? Right. So this is actually also pretty easy to derive the model, right? Because we just have to look at the second equation here and just see when is that derivative positive, larger than zero, right? So the idea, so this is the number of infected people is increasing when this derivative, right? The S is larger than zero, right? And this is equivalent to 
you know, I can just move things around. Right? That's new, which is the same as this sort of divide new on both sides and divide s on both sides. Right. So this is says that, okay, so if initially, right, s is going to be very close to one, right? So this term here is going to be close to one, right? So if initially, we call, just remember that the beta is the contact rate, how often do we contact other individuals, right? Nu is the recovery rate, right? So these are the two key constants, right? So if the contact rate divided by the recovery rate is larger than one, so that means that my infection rate is going to increase. Right. If it's less than one, that means that I don't really have an epidemic because the infection rate is always decreasing. So this key ratio then of the contact rate divided by the recovery rate is what people in epidemiology call, also call this R0, right? or it's defined to be R0. So it's kind of the replication rate effectively of this virus. So, and that's why this one is typically a in the beginning of the pandemic, right? So this R, R naught or this beta over nu, uh, you want to see is it larger than one or less than one, right? If it's larger than one, that means that this derivative is positive. So that means the number of infected people is actually growing over time. If it's less than one, that means that things are actually getting better. When people think about the potential second wave of the pandemic, right? So let's say in the fall, when, you know, if something else comes back, right? So this also gives us some, some kind of, uh, it's quite instructive to look at this, right? Because in the fall, if it comes back, then S is no longer one, right? Because the number of susceptible people could be actually be uh, a much smaller fraction of the population if the people who have previously been exposed would have some um, immunity, right? So under that assumption, the assumption that people do get immunity, right? So let's say if, if uh, R is, let's say, closer to, let's say, if 60% um, of people um, get immunity, then S is basically around 0.4. So this then implies that the critical threshold for, uh, for the is going to be uh, 1 over 2.4 or it's 2.5, right? So that means that, okay, so if the, a lot of the population actually has immunity already, then for the virus to spread, right, for this derivative to be positive, then we need the uh, beta over nu, right? So this, or the replication rate to be actually larger than 2.5, right? So 2.5, so very roughly, that's sort of one within the range of what people estimate to be the sort of replication rate um, of, of SARS-CoV-2, right? So which is why you hear numbers like, you need to have 60% of the people being infected uh, or to have immunity to prevent, to have this herd immunity kind of effect to kick in. Right? So that's basically coming from this kind of calculations. So even though the models are extremely simplified and lots of assumptions, but these are actually the, how people derive these kind of numbers, like you need 60% for herd immunity by looking at these kind of simplified models. Okay, so um, let me, shared a different okay so there's some um, also like a simple uh, co uh, call out notebook that we have here right which basically just implements exactly this uh, or like this model this ISRN model and you can actually play around uh, and we'll put this link on the on the class website, so you can actually play around with what happens, right? So initially, this you have one percent of infection, right? And we can increase the spread rate. Is basically this beta, right? So if you increase the spread rate, you can see that the 
blue curve, that's the susceptible population, and red curve, that's the infected population, right? So green is the recovered, so that's how the curves would change. Um, Right, and you can see what happens if I increase the spread rate, right? To, to, if I increase beta to be 0.2, then the increase of these curves becomes much sharper. Um, and you can also see what, so this is when there's no recovery, right? So when you have recovery, that's when this, um, right? So the, the green curve that corresponds to the number of recovered individuals. Uh, so let's say, what. Well, the interesting thing happens when we the recovery rate gets comparable to the spread rate, right? So that's when the beta over nu becomes one, uh, and that's the setting where um, you have a relatively few number of infected people, right? So the, the pandemic never takes off, and you and here you can also introduce some reinfections, right? Um, and so this is where you could play around with the the, the models. Okay, so that's all I want to cover for the, just for the introduction to these FP models. Um, and then this is sort of the core mathematical formulation of these models. And then next week, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the ways you can extend and generalize these models, which are basically the models that people at Imperial College and other places have developed that are underlying many of the policy decisions. Any questions about this? So hopefully now you have a pretty good sense of where the math actually come from um, and how you could uh, sort of just, you know, even if you don't know how to solve these differential equations, uh, you can just still, just by looking at some of their simple mathematical properties, have a lot of insights just of what these models behaviors would look like. Okay, so uh, Kunal, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, uh, thanks for that intro. Uh, my question was, uh, I've seen uh, both an SIR model and an SEIR model, and I was wondering uh, if we were to use these, is there a benefit to the SEIR model? Does it add anything that's more realistic for this particular virus? Right, so yeah, so, so the E in SEIR just corresponds to having a, a fourth compartment of people who have been exposed. Right, so we will look into that a bit more. So that's certainly, you know, one step at, towards making the SIR model a little bit more realistic. And there's a few other steps that people can take to make them more realistic. Like one thing you can do is to introduce additional compartments. And that's something that uh, like one of the projects that we have in the class is working on. Uh, you can also introduce migration patterns. Um, so I think they are all trying to make the model a little bit more realistic to better fit the COVID-19 situation. But I think the core, the common theme behind all of those models is this, the three compartments that we have here, the S, I, and R. Thanks. Okay, other questions? So I think it's a good idea. If you haven't, uh, some of you have seen this already, but if you haven't, then it's actually good to, um, Maybe go to the Collab notebook that we'll put up, and then so you can, I mean, it's just a couple of lines of simple Python code so you can that implements these models. So you could actually play around with the model. And the most important part is to really understand what are the assumptions of the model and how does those assumptions change the behaviors of the model. Okay, so I think that's all that we have for today, and then I'll see see you guys at the uh, see you guys next week.